Hi there, we're out of doors today um, and uh, the reason is that I saw on YouTube videos of people who had made uh, crystal sets, that's very simple AM radios and um, it looked like great fun and I haven't made one for donkey's years uh, so I thought it would be fun to try um, but uh, why are we out uh, here in the open air? Well the answer is yeah, the answer lies in this uh, very utility looking building which you see here uh, we've zoomed into it <clears throat> and we'll soon start to zoom out and we'll see other things um, including uh, yes on the left look there's a mast um, and then also look, there's another one over there um, and two of them in fact uh, now those are very tall masts um, they are uh, 700 feet tall, uh, 210 meters or so, and um, they are a radio transmitting station and a very powerful one. Uh, yes, uh, we're at Droitwich in central England, and um, this is the BBC um, long wave transmitter, which covers the entire British Isles, and uh, it's, it's powerful, it's 500 kilowatts. That's a powerful transmitting station by any standards. And as I said, it transmits on the long wave. So it's very powerful. I only live about 14 miles away from it. Uh, so this would be the one to go for if we're going to build a simple uh, receiver. But in addition to the long wave uh, transmitter, as we zoom back down from the top of this, uh, the tall long wave mast, um, you'll see the other mass which we actually have seen already and they transmit medium wave signals um, there are two of them and they are all transmitted from the same site this means we've got a variety of uh, signals uh, all being transmitted simultaneously uh, there's the two medium wave uh, masts so there's two different transmitters uh, on this site transmitting simultaneously BBC stations um, but there's also lots of other signals of course not far away is Birmingham Airport so there'll be air traffic control uh, there is all the emergency services there's uh, mobile phones there's uh, radio amateurs many other broadcasting stations in fact all sorts of radio waves um, mixed up together and if we want to receive this particular big long wave transmitter here we've got to have some way of selecting that particular one. Well, we're back home again now, and um, before we can start sorting out these various signals, uh, we have to do something first, which is to actually pick them up. And so here we've got an aerial. Yes, we've got a piece of wire connected to the top of that fence post held in place by string. And uh, if we look, follow it up, it goes there and down to the house and it goes in through that window there so here we are in the room and the wire comes in through the, the window frame and here's the end of it this is the end of our aerial or antenna and so here we've got a mixture of hundreds scores hundreds of different radio stations some of them powerful some of them very weak um, and some of them are long waves some of them are medium waves some of them are short waves some of them are really short waves some of them are micro waves um, so uh, how do we sort them out well i'm afraid it's going to get a little bit boring for a while because um, uh, well it's fun to know how these uh, very simple crystal sets work because uh, lots of other more complicated stuff gradually evolve from them. So we need a couple of things, um, like a piece of wire, and um, you say, well, it's just stuff we use for connecting things together, uh, which it is. This one's got clips on to enable you to do that. Uh, but if we take a long piece of wire, <clears throat> and here's a, some wire I salvaged from an old 
cassette recorder which I threw away and um, we can unwind it and it's quite thin and it's long and if we take some of this as I did and wind it onto a piece of scrap um, drain pipe and fasten it in place with a hole at one end and a piece of tape at the other uh, we've actually got um, about 250 turns of this wire on this piece of plastic drain pipe and now we've got the wire wound, round, wound in a coil like this um, it, it develops some quite interesting properties one in particular is that if you put a little bit of electricity into it um, the coil at first opposes that little electric current flowing so it starts slowly and, and increases now um, <laughs> so what well there's another very simple component uh, which we'll look at next so a coil is different to what it is if it was just a long piece of wire. Now is there anything else that we can look at which uh, changes? And the answer is yes. If we take a plate of oh, this is cooking foil uh, stuck to a piece of paper uh, and if we had two of these and put them together like that um, you know what would happen? Well we, we would have two plates conducting plates close together like that and, and would that do anything? So we've got two plates of metal close together and um, if we put a little tiny bit of electricity into one of them would anything happen? And the answer is yes it would. That electricity would charge up one of the plates um, and it would, the, the electricity would flow into it quickly at first because it wasn't charged up. And then as it gradually charged up, the flow of electricity would fall and eventually it would stop because this plate would be, the t one plate would be fully charged. Uh, now, if you remember, that's rather the opposite that happens if you try to put electricity through a coil. At first, the coil opposes the passage of the electricity, whereas a capacitor welcomes a flow of electricity to begin with and then it, the rate falls uh, and eventually stops. So uh, those are sort of equal and opposite properties. Um, so I, you know, what what can we do with uh, these things? Uh, you know, well, no prizes for guessing. We will connect them together and see what happens. Okay, I've fastened the end of the coils down to these two sheets using uh, black insulation tape. So if we zoom out and uh, see what we well we have got a sort of a circuit consisting of a coil and a capacitor. Um, now I think it would be simpler now if we actually look at a diagram of what we've got. Here's a diagram then, a coil of wire connected to the two plates of our capacitor. The bottom plate is curved in this but that's just some symbols I got off the uh, web for the diagram. Let's put in a little bit of electricity. Where that red arrow is, just pretend we've injected a little tiny amount of electricity into the wire connecting the coil and the capacitor together. Now the electricity will flow along the wire, but which direction do you think it'll mostly go in? Will it flow into the coil or will it flow into the capacitor? And again, no prizes for guessing, we know that a capacitor welcomes a flow of current, so... Yes, it predominantly flows into the capacitor because a capacitor welcomes the initial flow of electricity. And here, the top plate of the capacitor is fully charged. So, will it stay like that, or what will happen? Let's have a look. What happens is, is that that top plate doesn't stay charged. The electricity flows back around the circuit, through the coil, which offers some opposition at first, and it flows in the direction of the arrows and it charges up the bottom plate. And here you see now that the bottom plate is charged up. Well what happens then? The current flows back from the bottom plate round through the coil which offers some um, opposition to it round onto the top plate. But now you'll see the arrows are thinner and there's less charge on the top plate and so you know why is that? Well, the reason why the current stops flowing from one plate to the other 
uh, is because it gradually gets used up in the wire through which it's flowing, the resistance of the wire uses it up. You can't have perpetual motion, the thing can't just go to and fro for you know, a week or anything, um, you know, it dies away. Of course if you put more pulses of electricity in, uh, it would continue to work. And now this is a very, very important point we're coming to, which is that the rate, the frequency with which it flows from one plate to the other, is always the same for this particular coil and this particular capacitor. It's a characteristic of, of the number of turns on the coil, or how far they are apart, or the plates of the capacitor, how big they are and how close together they are. If you keep the same capacitor and the same coil, it will always have the same rate of flow from one plate of the other to the other in, a, in the capacitor. And this is a core thing in, in early radio in, in, to this day, this circuit which is called a resonant circuit. It has a characteristic frequency in which the charge goes from one plate of the capacitor to the other and it's always the same. If you put a lot of electricity into it, it won't go any faster it just does the same rate, and if you put the tiniest bit of electricity, it doesn't go any slower. It always goes at the same speed. If you think of a, of a, of a watch with a balance wheel driven by a hairspring, that can only ever go tick, 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 or if you prefer tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock. At that speed, it's inherent in the system, and uh, this is how we can use a circuit like this to get our required radio signal. We can use a coil and a capacitor to select the station we want. Now, in these illustrations we were talking about watches ticking, um, which go what, tick, 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 uh, you know, three times a second. Uh, but now we're talking about radio waves which have a frequency of um, many tens, hundreds of thousands, millions of cycles per second, or hertz as they are called, um, and tens of millions, hundreds of millions, uh, you know, but the principle is exactly the same. Uh, now the station that we visited at Droitwich has got radio waves of a frequency of 198,000 cycles per second. Uh, or 198 kilohertz, and that's what's transmitted out. So if we can get a coil and capacitor which uh, resonate around that frequency, uh, we'll find something very interesting happens. Here's our primitive circuit, and although I do do a lot of this stuff on the hoof, I have tried this out, and I know that it, with this coil, if I slide these sheets apart, to about there, then the resonant frequency of this coil and capacitor uh, is about 200,000 cycles per second or 200 kilohertz. It isn't an exact frequency, it's a band of frequencies uh, which will um, enable us to get hold of the station we want. Now at long last we can connect our antenna or aerial to the top of our coil and capacitor circuit. We should also connect the other end to earth, uh, but it usually works quite well without an earth, don't ask me why. But the point is that the aerial will bring in all manner of mixed signals, as we've discussed at length, and one of them will be the station which we want, which is around 200 kilohertz. And if we've adjusted our coil and capacitor uh, so that it has got a resonant frequency of about 200 kilohertz, um, this is how we tune it in. But the means by which our circuit gets us the station we want is actually rather counterintuitive um, and it's a very very important and subtle point. Our capacitor and coil which are busy um, resonating at around 200 kilohertz, right, the signal we want which is of about 200 kilohertz, comes down the aerial, but the, 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 the resonating circuit will not let it flow into it. Um, it offers an extremely high opposition to other signals of its own frequency, which is not what you'd expect, is it? 
All the signals that come through the aerial uh, antenna um, of different frequencies pass down through the corn capacitor and go away to earth and they are lost. And they are the ones we don't want. The one we do want, in this case about 200 kilohertz, it can't get through that circuit because that circuit offers a very high opposition to signals of that frequency. Therefore, it, we can tap it off along those wires with uh, black arrows. We can take it away and uh, treat it further. So you see, uh, when we talk about tuning in the station, um, we're not really doing that. We're, we're tuning it out uh, with that type of circuit, a coil and a capacitor in uh, parallel. That is called a rejector circuit. Everything can go through it except the frequency to which it is tuned. So it, that frequency is rejected and that's the one we want. So, as I say, we don't tune stations in, we sort of tune them out. Well, this video is getting very long, so it's time to get down to business and actually make our set work. And oh, by the way, yes, it is a crystal set. And uh, while we have got uh, pieces of drain pipe, bits of wire, cooking foil, pieces of paper, um, all around the house, which was easy to make, um, I was looking for something I could use as a crystal, the importance of which I will explain later. But I mean, a crystal set must have a crystal in it. And um, I looked high and low. I wondered whether there were some stones in the garden I could dig up and use. Um, but I, I couldn't. And there's no coal. Sometimes bits of coal work. Um, but I, I couldn't find anything like that. But while I was ransacking the house, I did find this little tin, which I will show you. And that will enable us to actually get our crystal set on the road, I promise you, within the next couple of minutes. Yes, I found an old tin, so I must have had it for 40 years, <coughs> which contains two small pieces of the crystal, or one of the sorts of crystal, because there were many, which was used uh, back in the 1920s. And uh, these are two little crystals of galena, which is a form of lead sulphide. And this little tin says that there should be a cat's whisker and instructions enclosed. Uh, well, they've disappeared in the fullness of time. Um, so we're going to have to use this genuine 1920s or 30s, I suppose, um, crystal. Um, so let's get on with it uh, because we're desperate to receive some radio signals. Uh, here's a little piece of crystal. I'm just resting it on the top plate of the capacitor. And that red wire has got some strands at the end and one of them is pressing lightly on the crystal. Um, with, with any look that will work. And uh, it, there's the two plates and the coil. And the red wire leads to that white crocodile clip and the black wire from the lower plate leads to the black crocodile clip and the black and white crocodile leads go into a nearby amplifier. So all we need to do now is to connect the aerial here and see what happens. At 5, and what do you know? A short while ago in New York, it the Dow Jones was down 118 points at 11,926. Well, there you are, it works. Um, I've been listening to it for a few minutes, listening to the news, which is bad as always. Um, but it shows that you can make a workable receiver out of uh, practically nothing. The only really weird part we used was a little bit of vintage crystal left over from the 1920s or 1930s. Um, but then again, uh, you know, there were those other two stations down at Droitwich, which are on the medium wave. How can we receive those? Well, we'll look at that next time. In the meantime, I uh, hope you've enjoyed this. I shall have a difficulty in compressing it down to um, a short size, but I um, hope you enjoyed it and see you next time. Mm -hmm.